Hey, Spuddies, Potato McWhiskey here, and welcome to Civilization VI Overexplained. This is going to be a tutorial series that is dedicated to Everlake. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about setting up a game. When you load up Civilization VI, you will have the option of a bunch of stuff here. The most important thing you should do is just play single player and create a game. I always go for advanced setup. And my recommendation is that almost everyone should play on Prince or below difficulty. If you're a relatively experienced player in the 4X genre and you've played a decent amount of Civilization games before, you could maybe start the game at King. And I think most people should settle around the Emperor difficulty, which is right around where the AI is interesting to play against, but you don't have to do every single thing that you want to do in the game super optimally. Today we're going to be playing on Prince because that is the difficulty that I would recommend people start on. If you're a young kid and you're relatively new, to 4X games, I would even go as far as to play as like Chieftain and Settler. My recommendation, particularly if you're playing on the Switch or console version of the game, is stick to small maps. Um, the consoles are not as powerful as the PC, and so they tend to struggle if you go for the larger maps. So you get the best game experience when you're playing on small or standard size maps. That would just be my recommendation. When it comes to map type, I think Continents is a pretty good map type to learn the game on because you'll only have two other opponents. You could, in theory, pick any of them, however, if you want to try them all out and just experiment with the game. My recommendation, though, is Continents. And when you're playing your very first few games, I actually recommend you don't change any of the options because you don't really understand the game enough to really understand the effect they're going to have on the game. So that would be what I would say. Just play a completely vanilla sieve and maybe you should consider playing as Rome. Rome, I think, is the best sieve to learn the game on because all of your cities start with a free monument, giving you that little bit of an extra advantage so that you know, so that you just have a little bit of extra power. On the other hand, you could honestly play any of the fairly vanilla sieves. And when I say fairly vanilla sieves, I mean sieves that don't horrendously break the game. Like, for example, Babylon completely changes and breaks the game. Gilgamesh is fairly a straightforward civilization. Uh, most of the sieves will break the game in a very unique and interesting way, with the exception of Rome. Rome is just really simple, which is what makes them a really good candidate to learn the game on. Because you don't have to worry about any complicated game mechanics. All you know is that you're getting a free building every time you build a city. And this is the settings that I would recommend, like your game seed, your map random seed, that's not very important. You just start the game. Now, you'll see people re-roll constantly to get a really good start location. I actually recommend against doing that in your games when you're learning the game. I think it's important that you play through a bad start location so you can start to formulate an understanding of why a bad start location is bad. Uh, it's often, sometimes starts look worse than they are at a glance. And so it means more if you take your time to learn how to play. Okay, so... Uh, now, talking about bad start locations, we actually got one of the most amazing start locations in the game because we spawned next to the Tori del Pain. We have a few things that we want to talk about. We have, we start with a settler. A settler is used to create cities and we have a warrior and a warrior is one of your most basic fighting units. This warrior will help defend you against barbarians in the early game, but it also serves as your very first scout. Now, the first thing that you want to do with, when you start the game up is you want to activate tile yields so that you can see what value each tile has. My recommendation when you're playing Civ is you never want to move more than two turns. So what I mean by that is you should be settling your city on the third turn. So it would be totally fine for me to walk over here or walk over here or maybe even walk up to here. Like there's a few places I could walk to where I would get good value, but I never want to do that for more than a couple of turns. And in fact, like I would say turn four is the latest you want to be settling a city. I'm going to scout up here to see if there's any value in moving towards the Torres, but I think we would be better off in just playing this very basic start location. I'm actually tempted to re-roll because we got too good of a start location. So I'm just going to quickly re-roll because that start location is way too good. Okay, um, somehow I don't understand how this happened. I literally found the Torres de del Pain again. I just, I don't, I don't get it, dude. I don't know what's happening. Listen, let me just, I'm just going to restart one more time. And if I find the Torre again, like I have found literally an impossible set of God Seeds. Okay, this looks like a little bit more of a standard and regular start location. We are a little bit in the desert, but I think this is very playable. So you always want to scout with your warrior before you settle with your settler. And the game will actually recommend where you want to settle. And, you know, these are generally actually pretty good recommendations. It'll tell you, like, here's fresh water, regional yields, new resources, close to a friendly site, a um, few new resources here. I would argue that it would actually be better for me to even move onto this rice and settle there. Um, and the reason for that is simple, is that coastal cities in a continents type game have some advantages. There are disadvantages, but a lot of advantages. Plus, actually moving on to the rice here with my settler would mean that my city would generate three food, one production. And the reason for that is city centers, actually, when you create a city, they generate plus 
two, oh, it doesn't show it here, but basically a city centre, when you settle it, will normally produce two food, one production, no matter what tile you settle on, with the exception of the tile has a resource or some sort of bonus yield. So if I settle on this bonus resource, it doesn't get destroyed. F woods do get destroyed, so that's something to keep in mind, um, but resources don't. So if I settle on this resource, boom, you can actually see, we get plus one error score, but the important thing is, uh, not only do we get a boost for being coastal, to sailing in the tech tree, we actually end up with three food and one production, which is 50% more food from this city center than we would normally get, which is, you know, not amazing, but plus one food is actually fairly significant because normally um, a city earning four food total, which is the typical amount that you'll earn with a basic city, will grow in eight turns, but a city earning five food in total will actually grow in five turns. So your city will grow a new population, which will allow you to work new tiles much quicker. Now, my recommendation when you're a fairly new player is that it's fairly safe for you to go for scouts. If you feel like you want to be extremely well defended from barbarians, you can go double or even triple slinger as your first build. I recommend against building monuments. I recommend against building builders. Those are advanced plays that you have to know what you're doing. The safest thing you can do is build two warriors. The second safest thing you can do is build two slingers. This is a compromise because slingers are slightly cheaper than warriors. Warriors cost 40 production, slingers cost 35. So that leaves you with slightly more production to do other things with. Scouts are a good option because they have really high movement, but they're bad at fighting. And a compromise between getting good scouting done and being well defended is to go for a scout and a slinger. Um, and then an even better compromise could be to go like scout, slinger, slinger. That's like a good, 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 good compromise. Um, the greediest version of this play is to just go double scout. Double scout is what I consider to be my standard play. But my recommendation is as a slightly safer play is just go for a scout slinger. Now, in terms of your first technology that you're going to be picking in the tech tree, uh, which is located up here on the top left of the screen, it says here, choose research. You really just want to kind of like look at your land, hover your mouse over what you want to do, and then make a decision based on that. Don't worry about stringing together a whole game long strategy. Just kind of look at things like, oh, do I want to go ahead and build a fishing boat? Well, then I should research, you know, the sailing technology. Do I want to go ahead and build, you know, on the citrus thing? Maybe I should research the irrigation technology. A couple of things I will say is going for a religion is really fun. So that might be something you want to consider relatively early into the game. When you're playing on Prince, you have plenty of time to invest. Um, building wonders is really fun. So for example, I could build the pyramids over here on this tile if I wanted to, because the pyramids is a wonder that just requires desert tiles. You can basically click, right click. I don't know how it works for the consoles, but you could just right click on any wonder in the game, at least on the PC. And you can see that, you know, what this can be built on. So it can be built on desert and desert floodplains. And those are two different tiles. You can see here, these are desert floodplains and these are desert. I think what we'll do is you do have a map tech system. So you can actually plan your empire. Just if you really want to, by the way, just something to keep in mind. But I think what we'll do is we'll go for what I call the safe opener, which is to go for animal husbandry. Now, why is animal husbandry a safe opener? It's because it will reveal horses on the map, which can inform you about where you want to settle your second city, because getting access to early horses can lead to you being, being able to go to early war. But we are playing Rome and we get really, really good swordsmen. So I like the idea of pushing in the direction of maybe like a swordsman type game. So that means we're probably going to want to get campuses to get science. And do we have any good campus locations nearby? We don't really have any very good ones. So let's just kind of like focus on heading towards irrigation. I want to get that citrus online. Citrus is our luxury resources. Luxury resources give you extra amenities. If your city has extra amenities, it will have a higher yield boost. Amenities are really good because they actually scale up the total yields of your city. If you're ever curious about how amenities work, I believe you can just look up amenity sources in here um, and it'll tell you about them. And then I think you can also type in happiness and that'll explain to you what happens when your people have higher amenities. Uh, a basic overview of this thing is essentially every single luxury resource provides one amenity to up to four cities. And if a city has plus three amenities, it will get a 10% boost to its yield. And if it has plus five amenities, it'll get a 20% boost to its yield. So amenities are quite powerful. Let's open with pottery because we are on a river. So we could potentially go for something like the Great Bath. In fact, Great Bath this game, if we decided to go for the Great Bath, we could have a lot of fun. Okay, because we're on a fairly big floodplain. We have a reasonable amount of production. And when you're playing on Prince difficulty, you can actually go for a lot more mods, which is why I was kind of excited to make this series or not a lot more mods. You can go for a lot more wonders, um, which is a very exciting way to play. And I recommend building a lot of wonders because that's actually just a lot of fun. Um, when it comes to scouting with your warrior, you kind of just want to scout 
in the direction that feels right. You'll get a feel for how scouting works. Um, I tend to kind of like try to skim along coastlines and then scout in like a radial pattern. But usually it's good to pick a direction with your warrior to where he's never more than like 10 turns away from your capital to be able to defend it from any potential invasions. So as Rome, you're going to unlock Code of Laws very early. This is the first civic in the civic tree. Each of each civic in the game will give you access to a variety of cards. Each of these cards has a certain benefit and you need to think carefully about which benefits you want to have access to. Sometimes you might only want to plug in a benefit for a single turn. Sometimes you want to have the benefit plugged in for a long time. In this case, in my opinion, um, faith is actually a very valuable resource in Civilization VI, so I think taking God King here is really good because it allows you to unlock an early pantheon, and the plus one gold per turn can potentially lead to you being able to buy important stuff in the early game. I would go as far as to say as being able to fight barbarians is so important in the early game that discipline is almost always an insta-lock, unless you have barbarians turned off or some other effect that makes you feel like you could fight barbs without discipline. But discipline just makes fighting barbarians so much easier. There is a place to say that you can plug in urban planning early. That's if you already have a source of faith and then plus one production becomes very valuable. Now, our early choice here in the civic tree is that we want to get access to some important cards. One of the most important cards in the game, particularly early game, is the colonization card that's accessible from early empire. This will give you a 50% production boost towards settlers. So it's very, very valuable. And remember, we're playing Rome. And so Rome gets a free building every time they build a city. So Rome wants to do what is called a wide build. Um, that is where they build a lot of really small cities. So Rome is the kind of civilization that wants to build a lot of cities, but you don't have to build a lot of cities when you're playing as Rome. You can space them out a little bit. Um, but I would recommend experimenting with the potential for a wide build as Rome. So I think we definitely want to head towards early empire. And to do that, I think we'll go for foreign trade. It looks like a barbarian encampment just appeared on this peninsula. And warriors are actually able to fight barbarian encampments alone, usually in the early game. So I'll kind of explain briefly how that works but it's fairly straightforward. I have completed my scout, by the way, and the main goal of the scout is to scout in a bit of a circle around my empire uh, with the slinger taking up the slack on this side, and then the scout will pick a direction and go to try to find other civilizations. So basically the goal of the scout is to find where I'm going to be settling my early cities. We have found another player and it is Norway. We will allow him um, to sample our hospitality. You can say we have no time for pleasantries, which won't uh, have good effects, but I usually just pick the top option because I'm lazy. There are reasons not to pick it, but I tend to find that I can just deal with it anyway. Um, we did just get a flood in the capital, which did fertilize a tile, which is kind of an interesting event to have happen. Um, and we are now working a nice citrus tile. I would say don't worry about locking in the tiles that your city is doing. Just let the city figure that out. As you become a more advanced player, you will go like, oh, you know what? I don't need food right now. So I'm going to tell the city to work production. Or maybe I really want this gold. So I'll lock this tile in. And you just lock tiles in by, you know, by clicking on them. One thing you should definitely be doing, though, is try to identify tiles nearby that have high combined yields of food and production. So for example, if I look at this tile, it has a high combined yield. It, ha it has a combined yield of food and production of one. It has one food and no production. This tile has a combined food and production yield of two. So this is what I would consider to be a minus one tile, right? Because it's not, it's, it's less than two. This is what I call a zero, t a zero tile, right? because I'm profiting zero. Every population that I have in the city takes two food to maintain. You can see that if I go in here and you can see the food consumption per turn is minus four. I have two citizens. So each citizen is eating two food. Ergo, if a tile produces two and, a and, and it takes a citizen to work that tile, that means that tile is producing zero. This tile with the th two food and three production, that is a three yield tile because a citizen is working this tile using two food, but it's producing one. So it's a one profit tile. So this is a zero profit tile, a minus one profit tile, and a plus one profit tile. Here's another plus one profit tile. It's a three product, a three food tile, which is quite nice. Early game, I would say in the first, I would say ancient and classical era, food is a lot more valuable than production. But once you hit the medieval era, production becomes a lot more valuable than food. So I would say for the first two eras of the game, you would prefer to work tiles that have more food than production. But after that, it's okay to start focusing on production. That's a general rule that you should follow. Um, and a tile with four yields like this, four food, the citizen is eating two food and producing two surplus. So this is a two profit tile. And the way that I want you to think about this is this tile produces three stuff and this tile produces four stuff. So you might be tempted to say that this citrus tile is 30, 33%, one third better than this tile or this uh, river tile is one quarter worse. But actually this four food is twice as good because remember, this is a one profit tile. This is a two profit tile. So one profit tiles, one is half of two, 
which means a two profit tile is twice as good. Similarly, this three food, one production banana tile is actually twice as good as this three food river tile. And in the same way, this um, zero profit tile is infinitely better than this no profit, that this negative profit tile and this one profit tile is infinitely better than this no profit tile. So it's just like a way to think about things is how you profit from tiles. That's why you got to think about like, what am I actually gaining as a surplus? Your goal in civilization is to input resources into what I like to call an engine, your civilization, and then output a profit from that, right? You're looking to profit, not just break even. That's why this citrus tile is really valuable. And early game, the main use of your gold should be to buy really high value tiles. For example, this three food, one production tile is fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and buy that because it's really high value. That will cut into my gold. However, I do think that gold has relatively low value early into the game. And I would much rather have food in production because the faster I grow the city, um, the more tiles I can work, the more tiles I can work, the faster I can grow the city, the more tiles I can work, the faster I can build things. So it's kind of like a feedback loop. And particularly, I would say for the first like three population in a city, working high food tiles is really valuable. So you can see here, I've got a four food tile, a four food tile and a three food tile. This is literally like a god roll start for a Rome. Um, we're going to have a really, really strong capital city. And then just focus on exploring. Um, if you want to clear a barb camp with a warrior, basically what you have to do is attack it once and then rest with your Barbarian until he's back to either full or almost full health and then attack it again and then attack it again, promote the warrior with uh, experience and then attack it one more time. So it'll take four attacks and a couple of cycles of healing, but we will be able to clear that Barb Camp. So Norway has actually spawned relatively close to us, which is fine. We got access to pottery. I'm going to get started on irrigation. Now it's important to note that you can see when you look at the research bar, of irrigation you can see it's around a circle and it's got a quarter filled like no, not a quarter filled about a third filled uh blue thing here how you boost that is by farming a resource now i actually do have a farm near my capital city so i'm going to tell myself that i should build a farm right there so i'm going to put down a pin using these map tags here to remind myself to do that because i know i want to do it which means i'm probably want to go for an early builder here in order to boost plantations how you want to manage early builders is you generally, it's nice to get an early builder to boost craftsmanship because the boost for craftsmanship is to improve three tiles. And that's worth, again, you could boost this, this culture civic, right? And that's worth, um, a Eureka is worth like one third of the culture of this civic. So it's worth like nine or 10 culture, which is like three turns of culture for me right now. So it's almost always worth it to be looking for boosts and to be delaying unlocking techs in order to make your navigation through the tech tree a little bit more efficient. So I'm just going to be generally scouting with my scout, just kind of scouting in a very circular-ish pattern and looking for places where I can settle good cities. My warrior is now fully healed and every time he attacks, he'll get five experience. So if I attack two more times, he'll get the 15 experience he needs to level. So I attack once, he loses a little bit of health, he damages this, he gets five experience and he attacks one more time and then he'll level up. We scouted with my scout and we actually found another continent which did boost foreign trade finishing that technology for me. So we can begin the research of craftsmanship. We don't need to finish craftsmanship, but we can begin it. And it looks like if we look down here, you can in fact see another continent, which is very cool. And you can tell that this is a lake, by the way, um, because lake tiles are part of continents, whereas normal ocean tiles won't be covered by the continent. Uh, these are the lens modes over here. Uh, some of the, or like, Things like religion, you don't matter early game. Continents are useful to tell where continent breaks are because certain abilities trigger when you cross continents. Appeal is useful if you're going for some sort of tourism play. The settler map mode tells you, um, generally speaking, the brighter green tile is a good spot to put a city. The darker the green, the darker the tile is, the less good the spot is for a city. You will learn how to adjust those rules for yourself as you play the game, but that is a general rule. Um, the government screen tells you the type of government people have. The political screen tells you who owns what. The tourism screen tells you about tourism. The loyalty screen tells you about loyalty. The empire screen tells you about your empire. And the power screen tells you about power. You'll learn more about those lenses as you play the game and figure things out. So I wouldn't worry about things too hard. I'm going to send my slinger to scout. All of your military units in the early game are scouts. That's important to, to notice. Um, but they're not abandon your capital defenselessly, scouts. Let's go ahead, and I think it's a reasonable thing to do to think about infrastructure. So there are two main ways, um, no, let me, let me rephrase that. There's a variety of ways you build infrastructure in Civ. One of the primary ways to build infrastructure is by settling city centers. 
That's probably the first way that you're going to build infrastructure. And in fact, it's the first thing you do in the game. Another way to build infrastructure is something you do inside cities, which is building buildings, which I'm going to represent with this hammer. So building buildings happens inside cities, as does building districts, like for example, the campus. That's a few different types and buildings also happen inside of campuses uh, and other districts. Another way to produce infrastructure is by building builders and population. And the thing is, builders work hand in hand with your population. You generally speaking, you want to have about as many builder charges for your empire as you have population because roughly every tile in your empire can be improved and therefore roughly every tile in your empire should be improved. Because here's the thing, if I were to be, let me, let me, let me talk about this farm tile here. If I were to be working this rice tile, I would be producing three food. If I put a farm here, okay, a farm will produce an extra plus one food. So I literally spend a builder charge to double the surplus of this tile. Now, when it comes to gold, it's a little bit harder to parse that. However, we are in an interesting and unique situation in the early game in that we actually have a pretty strong gold start if we do in fact go for a builder and finish irrigation. So I think I will go for a builder to get that extra gold start. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So my warrior could clear the barb camp right now. I almost always recommend taking the battle cry promotion because it makes your warrior extremely good at clearing barb camps because attacking Spearman now, he has 37 combat strength. Combat strength is a little bit of a complicated mechanic to fully explain, but the simple version of the rules is the bigger number wins the fight. If you have a bigger number than the person or more units than the person, you're typically going to win the fight. However, bigger numbers are worth more than more units sometimes. Um, so let's go ahead and make the attack. Boom, we clear the barb camp, we get a boost towards military tradition, and we also get about 50 gold. The amount of gold you're going to get is going to be dependent on the difficulty that you play on. So don't worry about that if the amount of gold you get is different in your game. But that gold can now be used for useful things like purchasing tiles. Like, I don't need another three food tile. I'm already working three really highly productive food tiles. So I'm going to buy this productive productive tile, i.e. it is producing production. And then I'm going to buy this really productive productive tile. Because what I want right now is to get as much production as possible because I would really like to build a wonder and I also want to get builders and I want to boost things and I want to, you know, that's kind of the direction I'm moving my empire in. I, I'd like to build some wonders. And the reason I want to build wonders is not because they're strong, but because they're fun. That's the really key thing that I want you to take away here. Remember, you're playing Civilization to have fun and your first few games should be all about having a good time. Worry about getting good when you have a little bit of experience underneath your belt. Now, an important thing to remember is that it can be a little bit scary to have barbarians come for you in the early game, but generally speaking, barbarians can't kill you in the early game. Even if you see like five horsemen outside your buildings, don't worry about it. Just start building units and you'll be totally fine. Now, typically you're gonna be presented with the choice early game between building settlers and building other stuff. Uh, it's almost always the correct play to build more settlers, but that's if we're trying to play the game correctly. If you just want to have a good time, build some wonders, man. So the cool thing about the Great Bath is that it makes floodplains in this city immune to flood damage and um, floodplain tiles belonging to this city get plus one faith each time a flood tile is damaged. We also get three housing and plus one amenity, which would allow us to grow a much bigger city. So I like the idea of going for the Great Bath and I'm going to place it right here on this tile. Where you place the wonder, it does matter, but I really, I just wouldn't worry about that until you're better at the game. I didn't actually mean to finish irrigation. That was a little bit of a mistake on my part, but that's totally fine. I'm gonna go ahead and research mining now because being able to build mines is actually very valuable. Um, for example, if I could put a mine on this copper tile, it would be worth a lot of extra money. Let's make sure we use our gold to buy this rice tile that we wanna improve. And the goal was to improve the rice tile to show that we've increased the profitability of this tile. And it was also meant to boost irrigation, but I forgot to stop researching irrigation again. Don't worry about making mistakes. Um, that's just part of not only life, but also just playing games. You're going to learn from your mistakes. What are the per perfect is the enemy of good is the saying they say. So we just finished craftsmanship and I was supposed to delay that too, but I would like to get the citrus online. So I'm going to send my builder over there. I'll be are slowly working on the great bath. Um, Norway is hanging around near my empire. I'm not too worried about that. I'm just mostly looking to explore and have a good time in the early game. All right, let's get to work on early empire. I think I would quite like that. It would allow me to get that lovely settler card and build my government, uh, my build my settlers faster. We have found another barb camp here and it's always in your interest to try to clear a barb camp. And you also want to scout to try to find city states. City states are fantastic people to find because not only do city states potentially give you quests. For example, Hunza wants me to trigger an inspiration for mysticism. Mysticism is a civic that requires me to found a pantheon. If you ever don't know where a civic is, you can just go up to the Civilopedia and type its name in. So if I just type mysticism, I can find everything I want about this, even with some cool blurbs about it, right? 
this is a very fun if you ever just want to have a good time and save, sit down and read this stuff like someone put a lot of work into these um, and you can see exactly what it gives you what it unlocks what it's required and what era it comes from so i know this is an ancient era and it requires foreign trade and the boost is to boost a pantheon so i know to get an envoy with hunza which will get me this bonus here which is plus two gold in the capital and plus two gold in every market and lighthouse building all i have to do is to get a boost for mysticism, which means I just need to found a pantheon. So you can kind of do all these logical trains. And when you play enough Civ, you'll start to do these sorts of logical analyses like on your own. So don't worry about that. It'll be slow in the beginning, but you'll start to get the hang of it. Don't worry about it, kid. You're doing fine. I'm going to go ahead and put a plantation on this tile. Plantations are interesting and unique tiles because if I... Um, if I create a pin, I can talk a little bit about plantations. You see here, the plantation gives you plus two gold, but it also gives you half a point of housing. Now, farms also give you half a point of housing. So if you combine a plantation and a farm, that's plus one housing in the city. And you can see if I go into the city management screen and I scroll down to housing, I'm getting five housing from being settled on fresh water. I'm getting one housing from the building because the city has the palace in it and the palace gives you plus one housing. And I'm also getting plus one housing from improvements because I've built a farm and a plantation. The plantation is cool because it's actually given me access to citrus. I'm trying to remember how I show you that. If I go to global, you can see here, I'm getting citrus, which means I'm getting plus one amenity. Uh, and so if I go into the city management screen and I scroll up to amenities here, you can see I'm getting two amenities from entertainment, which is coming from the palace, right? Plus two amenities from entertainment on the palace. And then I'm getting plus one amenity from luxury resources, which is keeping me at zero because every two population in your city requires an amenity. Actually, shouldn't I be at plus one? I'm trying to remember. Ah, no, yeah. You need three, yeah. One amenity can feed two population is how that works, basically. So think of amenity like food for your population, but it's a different kind of food. And if your amenities go too low, um, you'll start to suffer penalties. And if your amenities get really high, you'll start to suffer benefits. Um, let's go ahead and clear this barb camp. Sometimes you can clear them with scouts and there's plus three error score. So it's always really good to clear barb camps because you definitely want to be getting error score um, because there's special abilities that you can unlock at the end of an age if you get a golden age. Now, generally speaking, that's going to be true. There are specific scenarios in which you might want to go down to a dark age because you're running a particular strategy. Always take an opportunity to get a kill with a slinger, especially on a barb, because when you kill a, a unit with a slinger, you'll get a boost for archery. And also if you can kill three barbarians, you'll get a boost for bronze working. So think of these like early game things that are written on these. These are like quests. These are things you should do, which is really what's fantastic about this tech tree because it effectively, you could just like look at the era ahead and be like, ooh, I should set up for this. I should do these quests. Like for example, I have a quest to kill three barbarians and to kill a slinger. So I kill the slinger, I get the boost for archery and that's my third barbarian killed, which gets me the boost for bronze working, which is a huge amount of early game science, even though I haven't built a campus. So. There are two main ways to get science and culture in Civilization VI. You can build the buildings that give you science and culture, or you can do these quests. Doing the quests is, in my opinion, a little bit more fun, and it also means you don't need to build quite as much science and culture to stay on par with the AI. We just finished researching mining. Now, mining is probably the most important technology in the entire game, because the number one thing that I can say to players who um, frequently tell me about their problems playing Civ is that they do not build enough mines. If you have an opportunity to build a mine, it should almost always be your priority. Mines can be built. Um, you can check this by going into the Civilopedia, by the way. Mines can be built on any hill tile, as well as a variety of resources. But you can see here, desert hills, grassland hills, plains hills, snow hills, tundra hills, volcanic soil. These can be built on all of these stuff. Now, mines are really, really important because this is how you scale your production. Mines give you production. That production is used to build things. And then this production scales based on the amount of science that you produce because at various points throughout the tech tree your mines will get boosted so that's it's really really important that you build mines it's the most important thing that you do with your production is building mines okay i think we can go for bronze working because we would like to discover a source of iron because going for early legions as rome is a really fun strategy and so we would kind of like maybe like to go in that direction we have discovered rapa nui that is a cultural city state the color of the city state will correspond to the type of yield that they will give blue city states will give you science yellow city states will give you gold purple city states will give you culture gold is yellow faith is white uh culture is purple science is blue um production is orange and then i Red is for military. Now, Rapa Nui wants me to get a Eureka for the wheel. Now, the wheel technology, I happen to know, is down here, and its boost is to mine a resource. So actually unlocking iron and potentially revealing a mineable resource could help us. But I actually am already going to be mining a resource. I'm about to build a copper mine. So I got really lucky with these missions. 
in the early game. You don't typically get this lucky with these like really easy missions that are super easy to complete, but hey, it happens. So this is about as far as I feel comfortable scouting with my military units because they'll take about five turns to get back to the capital. So this is about as far as I want to scout. And in fact, I'm going to bring this guy back three tiles on the edge of my, or back like three to five turns to be on the edge of my empire. And you want your military units to be close enough to the capital to retreat to defend it. But I happen to know that Norway is over here to my southeast and someone with some sort of blue border is here to my south. So I know anyone who's going to attack me is going to be coming from the east or the south. So I can just position my military units in advance in those directions and know when an attack is coming and also also do the duty of what I call fog busting. Fog busting is a little bit like ghost busting, but for barbarians. Basically, barbarian encampments can only spawn on tiles that you don't have vision of. And barbarian encampments will always spawn within seven tiles of a, ca of a city, any city. A barbarian encampment always has a city that it's attached to. That's a really important gameplay mechanic for you to understand. So by clearing out fog near your capital city, you can prevent barbarians from spawning. Let's go ahead and place a mine right here on the copper tile that gets me the boost for wheel and it gives me another really high profit tile. A two food, two production tile. I would go as far as to say as two food, two production tiles are what I call perfect, pro perfect profit tiles in the early game. As in, it is hard to find a tile that is better than that. Um, two food, two production. It's what you want to be looking for, particularly in the ancient era. My capital city just hit six population, which has boosted the early emperor because it says grow your civilization to at least six population. Now that doesn't have to be in a single city. You could have six one population cities. You could have three two population cities or any combination of cities as long as the total population reaches six. Now it looks like Norway is actually trying to settle in my direction. And there's a kind of cheeky trick you can do is if you stand in front of their settler, um, it slows down how quickly they can settle. And it also, sometimes it annoys them and they'll go off in a different direction. So if you can like predict where they want to settle, and I predict they want to settle right here. So if I stand on this tile, they might get fed up with me and leave. This is just something you can do to predict the AI. It's an annoying little technique, but it's really, really fun to pull off. So like I'll stand here and I'm even going to start moving my slinger down here to participate in the block because this is like, this is like basically passive aggression, uh, civilization style. Let's go ahead and pick up this tribal village. Boost towards state workforce is fantastic. And my scout club plus five experience. Scouts get experience for, for scouting, basically. So with the unlock of early empire, a lot of new things have become available to us. Uh, we have access to the land surveyor skill, reducing the cost of purchasing tiles. We have access to the 50% production towards settlers, making it much easier, easier for us to settle cities. We have um, open borders agreements are now available. We could declare different kinds of wars. We have the ability to get governor titles. Governor titles are going to be one of the most important things that you get in Civ. My personal recommendation is almost always you want to go for Pingala because Pingala's tier two abilities, i.e. are like this is his tier one ability. This is the, well, I guess you could say this is his innate ability and this is his tier two ability or tier one ability. This is tier two and this is tier three. His tier one abilities, connoisseur and researcher are super valuable in the early game. Like I have six population in my capital city right now. So if I was able to get Pingala promoted, he could produce a 15% science boost and six culture and science, which is kind of insane in the early game. Another really good early option is to go for Magnus to get the 50% yield from plot harvest and feature removals in the city. This can actually be a really valuable thing, especially because you could potentially go into provision and chop out a bunch of units, which is really more of a Rome thing to do. So in my opinion, when you're playing as Rome, Magnus is a little bit more viable, but if you want to play it safe, go for Pingala. I'm going to go for Magnus because I just think it's a fun way to play. Let's get to work on state workforce. I got the boost from this from a tribal village, I think, so I didn't need to build a specialty district, but this is going to also unlock a governor title, which are very important, but also it's going to give you access to the government plaza, which is an extremely important building that not enough people build. Uh, conscription is really useful if you go for any sort of early war, and Core V is really good for building wonders. Let's go ahead and choose our Pantheon, and we have an awful lot of options here. Really, honestly, when you're new to the game, just pick the one that sounds cool. Uh, don't worry about picking a good one. Now, if you want to know one that's really good in almost every situation, the Divine Spark is what I would call the default Pantheon. It's good in culture games. It's good in science games. It's good in war games. Um, it's just generally a good Pantheon. Another good default Pantheon would be the Goddess of... Uh, the God of Craftsmen, which improves your resources that you get from strategic resources, plus one production and plus one faith. It's really just going to depend on like what you have. Are you going to be building holy sites? Maybe you should get stuff that makes your holy sites better. Are you going to be building wonders? Maybe you should get Monument of the Gods. We could go for a monument game here. That'd be kind of fun. You know what? Let's go for let's go for a uh, uh, an early game wonder wonder play. So I'll take Monument of the Gods. That'll be a fifteen percent production towards ancient and classical era wonders. I you know. You, I, I would recommend Rome would probably want to go with something like God of the Forge. And in fact, you know what? I think I think I'll play Rome the way they're meant to be played. So I'll take God of the Forge so we can go militarily. Probably shouldn't be building the Great Path, but whatever. I should really play Rome the way they were meant to be played. 
uh, they were able to walk through me so I wasn't able to block them fully but I was slightly annoying and that is mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. Now he might be looking to do a forward settle on me. No, he's just doing a generally safe settle which is fine. I just heard the barbarian encampment noise which means a barb camp has likely appeared near my capital so you want to click on this pop-up and see where the barb camp is. Now I'm going to redirect my military over there to go deal with that barbarian encampment. I would recommend generally get a feel for moving your units one tile at a time rather than like clicking their destination because units can get lost on the way. I mean this is fine if you're relatively new to the game to just send them off in a direction but your units can get into situations and die which is a little bit frustrating. So I would say generally, if you want to get better at the game, I would recommend learning to move your units one tile at a time rather than using auto explore or auto move. Okay, great bath is completed soon and we're going to get to work on some cool infrastructure. And I think um, for the sake of showing off Rome's abilities, I think we'll start preparing for a war with Norway. Now we did just get access to bronze working, which has given us access to iron. So we want to look around and see if we see any iron. Now, if you don't see any iron or you don't know what it looks like, there is a button here that you can use called the map search. And all you got to do is type the word iron in there, click it, and then hit the search button and you should be able to find iron. Now, here's the thing. The only source of iron is down here in the southeast, which basically means we won't be able to build our legions because our legions require iron. So we're going to have to go for a non-military early game strategy or we're going to have to try and go for horses. So let's go ahead and research horses because instead of legions, we might have to go for a horse-based military strategy against Norway. We have met Sweden. I almost always recommend the first time you meet a civilization, unless you plan to go to war with them immediately, like, like within the next era, you could send them a delegation. And what this will do is it'll slightly improve their relationship with you. And as long as you're playing on a standard game speed, you can send a delegation to a civilization on the first turn that you meet them. When this kind of screen comes up, always accept their delegation as well. It's just, it's just a, you know, it's a mutual little thing. It's nice to do. I've got 200 gold in the bank. So I think what I will do is prepare to buy a builder. We have finished state workforce. I'm going to go ahead and drop God King. And instead, I'm going to start colonization so I can start settling new cities. I will keep discipline in because I want to be able to fight barbarians effectively. Like this scout right here that's being annoying. I did get access to another governor title. And when you're playing as Rome, going for provision is a really fun way to play. Uh, settlers trained to the city do not consume a population. It's a really, really fun way to play. I super recommend it because we're about to do what we call the locust strategy. Um, and I'll explain the locust strategy in detail when we get to it. Let's get to work on political philosophy. Political philosophy is how you advance to the next government tier. And I would say that this is the most important thing that you're working your way towards in the early game. If you can hit this towards the end of the ancient era or the start of the classical era, you're on a really good pace. That's why it's really important for you to build your monuments. I play so many disaster files where people haven't built their monuments and they're wondering like, why is my culture so bad? So we just finished the Great Bath, which is fantastic. That's going to allow us to grow a really big capital because now we've got 10 population in here. And the really cool thing is, as we're going to be building settlers now, the population of the city won't be going down. So uh, normally when you build a settler, it'll reduce the city's population by one when it's completed. But if you get Magnus and go for the provision promotion, it won't actually go down, um, which is really cool. Also, these tiles are now producing faith because they flooded, which is a really exciting thing to happen. Um, it's kind of neat. Faith does have some uses in the game. Even if you're not going for a religious game, sometimes faith can be used for very important things. Like, for example, building national parks in a tourism game, uh, building uh, purchasing units in a militaristic game. You know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things you can use it for. So there's animal husbandry. We have access to horses and we have found horses here and here. But as per usual, my recommendation is to just type horse into the thing, search. Sorry, the bottom one uh, excludes things. You want to put it into the top. I, I, I'm... I missed up. Not house, horse. <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to find horses and you want to do a search. And I've got a horse here, a horse here and a horse all the way over here. So I definitely want to settle a city near these horses to get access to them fairly quickly. If I go to the settler map mode, I want all of these river tiles to be inside this city. So in an ideal scenario, I wouldn't settle adjacent to them like on this maze. However, it's not the end of the world if I do. And I would like to be able to settle adjacent to these horses. So maybe on the plantation or the bananas. Also settling on this plains hill seems good to me too. So I might go for that. So if I were to settle a city on the plains hill, okay, I can't have another city within three tiles of that. So one, two, three means the closest I can settle a city to the capital is on one of these two tiles. And I think I'll settle it right here. And the reason I want to settle it here is so I don't steal these tiles from the capital. Um, when you settle a city, all of the tiles immediately adjacent to the city will, will get gobbled up by that city. Now, there is, a, there is a scenario here where I could fit like three cities on this river, which is something that is worth doing. One, two, three. Um, but it's not something that I want to do in this particular game. So I'm going to space my cities out a little bit more. Um, 
because I think the situation calls for it. Um, it's also possible to clear a barb camp with just a slinger. What you want to do is to get within three tiles of it in defensive terrain. Now defensive terrain is standing on a tile across from a river, is some sort of jungle or woods, or even better, a jungle and woods hill. So uh, when you're standing in defensive terrain, like a jungle or woods, you'll get plus three combat strength defense. When you're standing in a hill, you'll get plus three combat strength defense. And if you're standing in a jungle slash woods hill, you'll get plus six combat strength defense. If you're standing across a river, you'll get plus five combat strength defense. And what this will do is basically the barbarian will see, oh, there's a slinger over here. I'll go try to kill him. Um, and he'll leave his barb camp, losing his fortification bonus. And then your slinger will be in defensive terrain. And if he's positioned correctly, he should get the first attack. Then the spearman will attack and damage him. And then the slinger will attack again. And the Spearman should try to run away. Um, and I'll actually demonstrate that to you now. So yeah, let's get to work on... I'm going to unlock the wheel right now and we'll continue our tech. So the, the Spearman should, in theory, come out of the camp. If you if you have to get him in his vision range, so I might have to stand on this hill. So if I stand on this hill, he might come out and fight me. Maybe if I move the warrior away. Okay, the Spearman wasn't feeling like playing today. So we'll just, we'll just do things manually. There's our first settler. I'm going to go ahead and purchase a builder. And I'm going to get started on another settler. Now, the ability of Magnus is actually an incredibly important ability that you're going to learn, need to learn to master if you're going to play the game at an extremely high level. Basically, Magnus increases the yield from harvesting tiles by 50%. So if I move a builder onto this forest and chop it, I will get like a certain amount of production based on the amount of science or culture that I've generated this game. Magnus will multiply that by 50%. So effectively, what I can do is I can take these tiles that I'm not working, that I can't improve, that I will be able to improve later and get something now faster. And stuff now is worth more than stuff later. And the simplest way that I, I can explain this, would you rather have $10 now and put it in the bank and start earning interest? Or would you rather have $11 a year from now and put that in the bank and start earning interest? If interest is 10%, you're probably better off having it now because the way compounding works, you'll end up with slightly more than $11, right? Yes, you're giving up like slightly technically slightly more stuff in the future, but that's a calculation you're going to be making when you're doing chopping. And it is the most important calculation you need to make when you're playing Civilization VI, um, is how to benefit, how to judge the benefit of something now versus something later. And almost always chopping is the correct choice. If you have the option to chop a tile, it is almost always the correct choice. And so my recommendation, if you're a relatively new player, is chop your tiles. Now I'm doing something that's not entirely recommended, but I do recommend you learn how to do this, is I'm sending my settler to go settle a city unguarded. Settlers are civilian units, which means they're completely defenseless to barbarians and other players. When you're playing against the AI, you'll learn when they're safe. When you're playing against barbarians, you'll learn when they're safe. Scouts are generally not interested in killing your, your, um, your guys unless they are... Uh, unless you killed their barb camp. So that's something to keep in mind. When you kill a barb camp, the scout that's attached to the barb camp will do what I call in an, an enrage and will just attack whatever the closest thing is to him. Let's go ahead and chop here. That will get us the slinger, a settler in one turn, which is really valuable. And the ancient era will end in 10 turns. Let's start getting these cities settled. I want to settle these cities so that I can get a slightly better loyalty yield on this tile. Um, I will get an immediate monument in my cities, which will help with loyalty. But by settling this city here, I will exert loyalty pressure on this tile. And Sweden is currently exerting loyalty pressure on this tile, as is my capital. But loyalty is very important. It just means that you can't go and like settle random ass places that you don't have the justified loyalty to do so. Um, you have to kind of settle near your own empire. The loyalty system is a little bit confusing and some people have difficulty with it, but it's relatively straightforward. Effectively, your city produces loyalty pressure equal to the population and then that loyalty pressure decreases by 10% for every tile that you move from the city. So traveling one, two, three tiles from the city, this seven population pressure becomes what? Uh, seven multiplied by 0.7 uh, or seven minus 30%. So one, two, three, four, five at this range, the pressure has become 3.5. At this range, it's become like two point something. And at this range, it's become like almost nothing. So just, just things to keep in mind. Um, we've built two settlers. Do I want to keep going for settlers? I think my build right now is going to benefit a lot from going heavy into settlers. Rome benefits from going crazy on settlers, in my opinion. And so that's what we're going to do. Let's settle our second city. Generally speaking, when you're settling cities, you just want to have somewhere that has really like decent resources, decent tiles, has good fresh water, and also secures your borders. So you can see here, one, two, three, it secures all this empty land. So when I settle this city, no one else can settle here now. So I've effectively secur secured this for my empire. And I've also increased the loyalty. It's kind of hard to see, but I've increased the loyalty on this tile slightly. So we should be able to settle it comfortably. 
Uh, the first thing you want to do when you settle a new city is almost always to build a monument. In Rome's case, it can be worth it to go for things like warriors. Um, in my particular case, I think it would be better if I were to start on like a builder or a trader. The granary can be good. I don't think we need a granary in the city right now. I think the thing to go for would be to get another scout because I only ever built one scout and it would be nice to have a little bit more information about Norway and stuff like that. Let's chop again to get another settler. And I'm going to go ahead and improve this silver to get me another plus one amenity to keep my empire happy. The ancient era ends in seven turns. We have gained plus two era score for researching political philosophy. We have access to the wheel. Now, political philosophy is when you're going to be making a very interesting choice in your empire. You need to choose which early game government you're going to go for. I'm going to say right now, classical republic is almost always the correct choice. However, there are situations if you're going for an early war where you want to go for oligarchy and there are situations where you want to build a lot of wonders where you go for autocracy. Generally speaking, classical republic is the best one, but these ones do have their applications and it should be fairly obvious when they're to be used. I'm going to go for classical republic here because it will allow me to plug in two really important cards. Not only will I be able to plug in colonization, I'll also be able to plug in urban planning and I'll be able to plug in god king for that extra little bit of gold. I'll keep charismatic leader plugged in to get extra influence points towards earning envoys. This little symbol up here shows you what your envoy production is at. Right now I produce three influence per turn. So plugging in charismatic leader is a uh, increase to five, which is a 66 or two thirds increase, uh, which will massively increase the rate at which I get influence. So instead of taking 30 turns, it'll take 20. Very, very valuable to plug in charismatic leader if you want to play around the city states in your game. And honestly, learning how to deal with city-states is one of the most important things in Civilization VI. I would say you almost always want to have at least one envoy with every single city-state in the game. And then you want to go to higher levels of envoys based on the situation that you're in. So let's go ahead and build a mine here on this silver. And while we could theoretically work that silver tile, it's not important. We really just wanted the luxury from that. So now we have plus one amenities in the capital and we have plus one amenities in the newly settled cities. Amenities are an incredibly important part of the game. A lot of people neglect building and improving amenities, myself included, um, but it actually puts your empire in a really bad position if you do that. Um, now, generally, you actually want to avoid building arch uh, doing archery as a tech. So I'm going to go for masonry. And then after that, I'm going to build two slingers. And the reason that you avoid researching archery unless you need to defend yourself is because if you build two slingers, it's actually cheaper to upgrade archers into slingers than it is to build archers in terms of total resources. And if you get three archers, that'll give you the boost for machinery, which is one of the quests that you can do. And then cross upgrading to two crossbowmen will give you the boost to metal casting. So by making these really early game decisions, we can actually have ripple effects down the entire tech tree. And there's a lot of chains like this. You're not going to know them all yet, but this is the most important and simple one. And the reason this is the most important and simple one is because archers and crossbows are the default defensive unit because the special ability of archers and crossbows that it's, it's not that they're ranged units, it's that they can do damage without taking damage, right? Which means they're excellent at standing inside a city and doing attritional damage. Also, their promotion tree, as they level up, um, when they get enough experience, gives them a lot of extra damage. So archers and crossbows are your premier defensive units, and you want to build three slingers before you research archery 95% of the time, and then you want to upgrade them into archers and then you want to upgrade at least two of them into crossbows when you get a chance. This will just get you extremely good defensive techno like defensive capabilities and offensive. Archers can also go to war. It's just an extremely flexible early game thing that you should almost always be doing. Let's go for mysticism so that we can get that envoy and start to maybe take suzerainty of a city-state. Although, actually, I would say military tradition is a really important tech to get, a civic rather, because it gives you flanking and support combat bonuses to all of your units. And flanking and combat support bonuses are a little bit complicated if you've never heard of them. But effectively, if you have a unit that attacks in melee, if it's attacking a unit that has more of your units around it, so like, let's say I had a unit here and I had two melee units here, this guy attacking would get plus two bonus to his damage roll, like his, his combat strength, because of another unit. So the maximum you can get if you fully surround a unit is plus 12. And plus 12 is an insane amount. So the flanking and combat bonuses is really, really important. And that also applies in the reverse on the defense. If I'm being attacked and I have five units around me, I'll have plus 10 combat strength on the defense. So flanking and support bonuses, very, very important to know how they work and when they apply and how to actually make use of them. I think I would like to settle up towards this river direction. And I think in order to block Norway, 
from doing any shenanigans with this river, I'm actually going to settle on this marsh tile right here. Because what that will do is by settling on this marsh tile, one, two, three, it'll eat up all of these potential tiles. And I can always build an aqueduct to this river to get fresh water. So it's a worse city in the short term, but it serves a really important purpose of blocking Norway from settling close to me. Let's go ahead and settle our third city. And we are, you know, we're, we're getting our empire built up. Um, in this city, I will be going for a trader. I'm going to get to work on a trader. It's about the time of the game that I should start trading with either a city-state or my own cities. Traders are what I call empire-wide infrastructure. Empire-wide infrastructure are things that are extremely limited. So for example, diplomatic favor, that's empire-wide infrastructure. Envoys, those are empire-wide infrastructure. Local infrastructure is things like tile improvements, um, buildings, wonders, right? But sometimes wonders can be empire-wide. Empire-wide infrastructure like trade routes, spies, envoys, these things, governor titles, these are incredibly important to get as soon as possible. That's my recommendation. It looks like there's no real way through the mountains with Sweden, except through this mountain pass, which honestly makes it really easy for us to defend, but also for them to defend. So I think Norway is going to be our target if we do in fact go for an early war. And I think it would be interesting to go for an early war. Okay, let's go ahead and settle right here. Boom. And we will keep exploring to see if we can find anything that will give us era score. I'm going to send this settler or this slinger over to Ravenna. I'll send you to Aquilia. And mostly this is just to have a unit nearby to defend these cities. Okay, let's get mysticism for the plus one envoy. We could choose production in the newly settled city. Um, a good option for this city because it's off of fresh water. Remember, there's three types of water. There's no water, there's coastal water, and there's fresh water. Rivers, lakes have fresh water. So here's a lake, has fresh water all the way around it. Here's a river, you can see the fresh water. Uh, here's no water, here's coastal water. This city has coastal water, so it means it starts with three population. So it's honestly, it's a good option to go for an early granary there. Oh, a meteor shower. Meteor showers are pretty nice because it'll give you a free cavalry unit. Uh, and free cav heavy cavalry units are useful for both defending your empire and attacking other people. So something to keep in mind. There's mysticism. This will give us access to some pretty cool cards, but they're not particularly important to us. The preserve is a pretty advanced district that I would recommend against playing around with until you fully understand the game. So don't worry about that. Now, what do we want to do in the capital city? Well, I think the most important thing that we should get done early game when you're playing as Rome is to build yourself a government plaza. It's a very, very important district, especially when you have your government unlocked. Where you place it does matter um, because it's a special type of building that gives plus one adjacency bonus to all districts. But we're going to worry about adjacency bonuses in probably the next episode. So I'm just going to put it here for now because it's a, it's a low quality tile that doesn't do anything. And we'll worry about talking about how to get super optimal government plazas, maybe in a more advanced series. This is mostly just to talk about super basic things that are going through my head as I'm playing. Uh, now that we have political philosophy, one of the most important texts to get to in the classical slash medieval era is to go for feudalism. This will give your newly trained builders plus two extra build actions. Um, but I think we've basically completed the ancient era. And so I'm gonna leave my commentary here at right now. So this is my general guide to the ancient era. I want to thank you guys very much for watching. I love you all very much, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.